reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to stop. This evening, let's take our Bibles and turn in the New Testament to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14. Mark's Gospel, chapter 14. We're going to look at 14 and 15, God's Suffering Servant. Today is Monday, Thursday, or from your other tradition, if you have that background, it's Holy Thursday, uh, celebrating the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on Friday, Good Friday, and then, of course, anticipating the resurrection on Sunday. Monday, Thursday is a Protestant way of referring to it, and uh, it means uh, it comes from the Latin word mandatum, and it means a commandment. This is the command that I give to you, the Lord said, love one another. And so uh, let's begin our study with Mark 14 as we look at the, ser the servant's suffering, and then chapter 15, uh, the servant's sacrifice. And let's bow our hearts before the Lord. Father, we're grateful for this chance to remember what Jesus has done for us, the tremendous cost, the sacrifice of his life, the shedding of his blood for the forgiveness of our sins, for the healing of our bodies, our souls, our spirits, our finances, our relationships. Total deliverance, total freedom in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Now, we've got a lot of verses to cover, and I'm going to be selective in what we cover. Uh, let's go to Mark chapter 14. We're now down to the uh, final night. Uh, this would be uh, Thursday night. And uh, in beginning in verse 1, we've got uh, a little setting of the scene here. Jesus, uh, the suffering servant, is going to be anointed for burial. Uh, this is very symbolic, and this is very powerful. Um, in chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. After two days, it was the Passover, and the feast of unleavened bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. Thousands upon thousands of people would gather in Jerusalem for the important Passover, the celebration of the deliverance of Israel from Egypt as the Lord had told them to take the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorposts and the lintel. And Jesus, the death angel, when he saw the blood, would pass over those houses and not kill the firstborn. That was the celebration. That all looked forward to, anticipated the ultimate sacrifice of the Lord Jesus, who that following day would shed his blood for the forgiveness, the complete removal of all sins. Well... The time is drawing near. The Lord has told them again and again that he's going to have to be sacrificed. The disciples, like us, heard it and didn't hear it. It registered in the head, but it didn't get down those 18 inches into the heart. But there was somebody else who was paying attention and whose heart was moved, and that was Mary. Verse 3, not Mary the mother, but Mary the sister of uh, Lazarus and of Martha. Being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. She broke the flask and poured it on his head. They were at a house of Simon the leper. Do you think he was a leper at that time? No, Jesus would have healed him. He would have healed him of leprosy as he did others. And so they were there in that house and uh, it was a... Uh, chance to celebrate the Lord's uh, burial coming up. The others didn't know it. The uh, disciples were rather hardened in their hearts. Their focus, like us, was on self, not on the Lord. So there were some who were indignant among themselves uh, because of this waste. They said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? It might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they criticized her sharply. So there was criticism in this act of worship of the Lord Jesus. 
And as Mar Mary took this very costly oil that would be worth uh, 300 denarii, a denarius was a day's wage. 300 days wage, it's almost a full year for let's say a working person, a person that might make 40,000 a year or 50,000, take that's almost the full salary. In today's money, this would be worth 30, 40, thousand dollars just break it open pour it down his body and it's gone seems like a waste doesn't it well sometimes worshiping the lord seems like a waste to others sometimes it seems like a waste to us what a waste i have to sit in my prayer chair and pray i get up in the morning and i see my wife praying in the prayer chair i might be tempted to say what a waste of her time she prays, she studies the word, she prays for every member of this church, she prays for her president, and on and on and on. What a waste of time. She could grab a cleaning rag and get the house all cleaned in the time that she prays. But she puts the Lord first. She has time to clean the house, by the way. She finds that time because God does want that done too. But people criticize us. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to worship. I haven't got time to visit somebody in the hospital. Mary had time. The disciples, not so much. Well, they're criticizing her, and Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. When you worship the Lord, when you serve, it's a good work. You picked up someone and brought that person to church. That's a good work for the Lord. You baked a casserole for somebody who just got out of the hospital and hasn't got time to make something. You did a good work. You visited somebody in the hospital. You get the idea. As far as the poor, you have the poor always. Isn't that true? But what she has done, the Lord said, that's going to be preached around the world, verse 9. What she has done is going to be a memorial for her. This act of Mary is celebrated by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. As we get to heaven, the good works of all of the saints are going to be celebrated. And as I have good works, whatever they've been, by God's grace, they'll be celebrated. Your good works will be celebrated. And maybe there'll be ovations and maybe there's not. I don't know. But I'm going to tell you, something special is going to happen when Mary stands up and comes forward and the Lord rewards her for this. This wasn't the only act that Mary had done. We know elsewhere that Jesus was in the brother's house and Lazarus' house. Mary and her sister Martha were there. And uh, Mary was criticized again by her own sister. Mary was sitting there listening to the words of Jesus. And Martha was busy with the housework, doing the dishes. And Martha was so upset, she said, Lord, you know, she's not helping me. I'm doing this all myself. And Jesus had to say, she's done the better part. Sure, the Lord likes clean dishes. They'll be done in time. But while you have me, listen to me. And again, she was being criticized. There are those who put the Lord first and they're being criticized. If that's you, be like Mary. Turn a deaf ear to your critics and continue to serve the Lord. He's well pleased and he'll remember what you've done. Well, Mary is contrasted with one of the disciples, Judas. Look at verse 10. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray him, and when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money, so he sought how he might conveniently betray him. What was his motive? Well, we've seen something here about his motive, haven't we? Money. John tells us that there was a treasurer who had the purse of money for the disciples and Jesus. And who was the treasurer? Judas and who was stealing from the purse? Judas. So he was about the money. He served mammon instead of God. Is there any Judas in me? Am I putting the Lord first? Is money more important to me than serving him? When you serve him, he'll take care of your money. When you put him first, he'll find a way to take care of you. But if we try to say, I haven't got time for you, Lord. I can't go to church. I can't read the word. I can't pray. I'm too busy making money. And this job doesn't give me enough money, so I need a second job. And I don't have time to serve you, Lord. And this second job doesn't give me enough money. I need a third job. I don't have time to serve you, Lord. And these three jobs don't provide for me, and so I need to get a loan. 
etc., etc. Put the Lord first. Let him take care of the finances. Bring your tithe into the storehouse. He says, bring your first 10% to me, and I'll take care of the rest. When the taxes don't go your way and the Congress changes the tax laws they just did, and you're being disadvantaged because your contributions are no longer tax deductible, if you're a tither, you take the attitude, sorry about that, Lord, you've got to make it up to me some other way. You'll have to make it without that tax break, etc. Well, so he's going to betray the Lord. Meanwhile, the Lord is taking his disciples and he's going to take the customary Passover meal, which they have celebrated every year for about 1,500 years since Moses led them out of Egypt. It's a typical Passover meal. Tonight is Thursday night. Tomorrow is Good Friday. Saturday is Passover for your Jewish friends. They will celebrate Passover this Saturday, and the Christians will celebrate Resurrection Sunday, often known as Easter, the following day. And so this becomes something all your Jewish friends will observe Passover. I don't care if they're Orthodox, if they're conservative, or if they're Reformed, or if they're very liberal, they will celebrate Passover. And uh, if you've never been to a Passover celebration, perhaps one of your neighbors might invite you. It's very, very interesting and very informative about how God delivered them from Egypt. In this church, we used to have for many years uh, a Passover celebration with a messianic perspective. My late father, as you know, our pastor Mort, was Jewish, and he would lead us in a traditional Passover meal with an untraditional Christian edition of celebrating Jesus. And there are Haggadahs, which are the books for the Passover celebration online. You can order them. You might even be able to see them in a PDF form printed out. I think we've gotten rid of all of ours. But we had that for many years, many, many years. And to me, it was the finest celebration and the closest we came to the Lord in any service with that, to see this Jewish man who had been persecuted all of his life for his faith by Christians because he was Jewish, and then becoming Christian and persecuted by Orthodox Jews for being that. He just couldn't get ahead. So he decided to just love everybody and spread out the net of love, and God blessed him. But the day he died, that was the last time we ever did it again. I never felt led from the Lord. The Lord said, that chapter is closed. We never celebrated it again, but I'm grateful for it. We used to get the whole place downstairs was packed, overflow rooms. It was the most wonderful time of celebration. They're having that kind of a meal right now. And the Lord's getting them ready for it. He's got the place set up. And uh, verse 22, he's instituting the traditional celebration. They've got all of their uh, food there. And then he takes two elements toward the end of the Passover meal. He takes the bread, which is the unleavened bread, much like our matzah, if you will, uh, and then the cup of wine. Verse 22, he's going to take these two symbols and turn them into a new celebration, which we know is communion. Some call it the Eucharist. And he takes, first of all, the bread in verse 22, and he says, take, eat, this is my body. And by that, he's really saying this represents my body. And then he took that cup and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. The first covenant was the covenant of Moses at Mount Sinai. We've covered that in the book of Exodus. When that Ten Commandments was done, there had to be the shedding of blood of animals sprinkled on the book, on the, the commandments, also on the people, because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. That comes from Hebrews. Without the shedding of blood, sin is so awful, there must be a death of a perfect, sinless person. And only Jesus, the Son of God, could fulfill that. And so now he says the body represents, is represented by the bread, and the cup, of course, represents the blood. And uh, he goes on to say now that verse 27, of course, he's giving them a warning. You're going to stumble. You're going to be... Tempted to desert me, verse 27. All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it's written, and here he's quoting here from the Old Testament, Zechariah, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And uh, he goes on to say, but notice this, after I've been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. I'll be raised again and I'll meet you back in our hometown of Galilee. 
Well, they uh, forgot about that last part, didn't they? And of course, Peter knew more than Jesus, even as Jerry knows more than Jesus. Every time I tell the Lord, he should have done this differently, and I'm unhappy about that. I think I know more than Jesus. We all do. And the Lord says, no, nope. uh, Peter says, no, nope. even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not. <laughs> These other guys might uh, stumble. I have no confidence in them. But I'm the only one that I know is going to be faithful. And the Lord had to tell him, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Oh, how much we're like Peter. And of course, the others felt the same way. Then he wants to pray. He wants to get himself fortified for the journey ahead, the uh, trial ahead, and actually trials. And so we see here in verse 32 that he's going into his favorite area of prayer, the Garden of Gethsemane. That's over on the Mount of Olives. And Gethsemane means that wine press where they would press the olives for olive oil. <clears throat> and he said to the disciples, verse 32, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him a little bit deeper into the garden, a little closer to that place of prayer. And he wanted them to be there to support him. Verse 34, you see the heart of Jesus. You see the humanity of Jesus. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He's very sorrowful. Why? He's human. He knew he's going to go to the cross, but others have gone to the cross. That next day, there's going to be two thieves. Not to make light of it, but crucifixion was common under the Roman rule. And so why would he be so sorrowful? Well, anybody would be sorrowful to be crucified, to be sure. But unlike them, he would have to bear. He who knew no sin, Paul says, became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He had to carry all of our sins and all of our sins' consequences. Disease. He had to carry diabetes, cancer, blindness. He had to carry all of our emotional problems, anger and hatred, our lusts, and uh, all of the sins and the consequences, broken relationships. He had to experience divorce. He had to experience abortion. He had to experience everything. All of sins he had to carry. Unbelievable. Of course, he was sorrowful. But he had his prayer partners there, didn't he? Or didn't he? No, nah, they weren't there. They were sleeping. They were sleeping. So it's great to have others pray with you, <laughs> but don't forget to pray yourself. You may have a lot of support. That day you might be the only one praying, but God will hear even one. And so now he's struggling, verse 36. He knows the plan. In his humanity, he knows the plan. In his divinity, he's always known the plan that he would have to die for all the sins and consequences of all mankind. But notice how he gives it to God. Verse 36. Abba. Father. That's, Abba is an affectionate term in the Aramaic. It means daddy. Papa. Father, all things are possible for you. You can do this, Lord. Take this cup away from me. Remove this cup of suffering. Find some other way for Jerry and all sinners to be saved other than my having to go to the cross on their behalf. You can do this. Take this cup from me. Nevertheless, and this is what turns this into the most divine of prayers, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Not what I will, but what you will. Not what I will, but what you will. Tell God what you want. Tell him your desires. Tell him he's able to do what you want. But always end up with not what I will, but what you will. That keeps you safe. That keeps you in the perfect will of God. Well, he found Peter sleeping in verse 37. He told him to watch and pray. Don't enter into temptation. Oh, that spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We know that. And he went away and it took him three times Took him three times to pray that prayer until he finally had the peace. He gave it over to God. You can't get the victory the first time, pray a second time. Can't get it the tenth time, pray eleventh time. You pray until you've got it done. You need prayer from somebody else, go to them. Go to the elders, go to me, go to anybody. Keep praying until you know you don't need to pray anymore. And when you don't need to pray anymore, it's on the altar. And I love to hear those words. May I pray for you? No, Jerry. 
It's all done. It's on the altar. I know it's going to happen. I'm waiting for it to come to pass. Until then, we're going to keep praying. But once you have gotten to the point of saying it's done, I'm going to say, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And praise the Lord. Well, the betrayal takes place, verse 43. We all know about that. Judas has gone and gotten a whole gang of people, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, verse 43. He has a signal, whomever I kiss, a sign of affection now becomes a sign of betrayal. He is the one, seize him and lead him away safely. So there's that betrayal. And uh, we uh, know that the, uh, Peter gets up there. Peter's all there for the, for the Lord. He gets that sword out, verse 47, strikes off the ear of Malchus, the high priest's servant. And Jesus has to stoop down, pick up the ear, put it back in place. With all that he has waiting for him, He still has time to care about something insignificant, except to Malchus, his ear. Whatever you have, I don't care how small it is. Lord, I've got an ingrown toenail. Is that important to God? Of course it is. It's important to you, it's important to him. Whatever it is, the Lord says, let's go. I was with you daily, verse 49, you had a chance to take me, but he submitted. I love Mark, he's like me. Look at that class picture of me in high school. Look at that wedding picture with the family around. Who do I look for? Oh, I look so horrible. You look for yourself, don't you? Mark, with all this scene going on, hundreds of people and the disciples and whatever, he's looking for himself in the picture. Now a certain young man, that's Mark, followed him having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body and the young men laid hold of him and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Just wanted to let you know that I was there. Thank you, Mark. And we're reading his gospel now, which he learned from Peter. But we're like that, don't we? We want to, want to see ourselves. And that's all right. God understands it. Now he has to go through trials, trials that are all rigged. And uh, there are going to be six trials all together he has to go through. Three religious trials, three civil trials. The first religious trial is going to be by going to the former high priest, Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the current high priest. Caiaphas was getting the Sanhedrin, the 70 ruling elders together to come and pronounce judgment against Jesus. But they were so anxious to get started, they already had him in hand. They go to Annas for a preliminary trial, if you will, just to give Caiaphas more time to get the Sanhedrin together. And so they do, they go to that trial. And then they get to the second stage. They go to Caiaphas, who now has the 70 together. And they have this trial at night, which is illegal in their law to try somebody at night. So they got to have a third trial all over again to try him during the daytime. Like so many of our trials today and so many of our hearings today, The outcome is determined, prejudice and bias is so that we know what the outcome is going to be. You see that in the C-SPAN hearings with the person being brought before and one one party is going to grill and try to fry the witness and the other party is going to try to lift him up and defend him and so we see that. In this case, they're going to try to put him to death. And so verse 61, the high priest asks him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? You see, they couldn't get any testimonies uh, that would really uh, go against him. They're trying to get witnesses. The law had said, God's law said, you must convict by the mouths of two or three witnesses. Not one, not one witness. You've got to have two witnesses or three to convict somebody. They tried to get the witnesses. They couldn't get any witnesses to agree. And so they finally found two witnesses who bore false testimony. They were paid, no doubt. Look at verse 58. They said... Jesus said, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. That's the accusation, destroying the temple. They think it means the temple standing there in Jerusalem, the temple of worship, and that was a capital offense. To destroy the temple would be a capital offense. We saw somebody, uh, we read it this morning, I guess it was, uh, they arrested some young man who was trying to do a copycat uh, destruction of a, of a spiritual house 
following the very sad accident over in Notre Dame in Paris. And this young man uh, had uh, two gasoline cans and two lighter fluids and two uh, uh, of these uh, starters, or the, uh, the igniters. And he was going up to St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. And they arrested him. And he said, oh, I was just trying to pass through the cathedral to go to my car to fill it with gas, which is out of gas. They smartly said, let's check your car, which did not need any gas. He was thrown into jail. And that was it. And so to destroy that house would have a serious consequence. He might be in for some trouble. To destroy the physical temple would mean death in those days. But Jesus wasn't talking about the physical temple. He was talking about his body as the temple of God. Destroy this temple, I will raise it in three days. By extension, he's saying to me, when you die, I will raise this body on the resurrection day. And so we now see the Lord's going on to, to be able to be entrapped. and He knows what he's doing, verse 61. The high priest asked him, saying, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? So it was illegal to have a trial at night, but it was also illegal for the judge, in this case the chief priest, to try to entrap and to get a witness to convict himself. And that's what he's doing. He's challenging him. They're not getting any place. Let's move this along. Are you the Christ? the Son of the Blessed. Elsewhere it says, are you the Son of God? I'm glad he asked that question. Are you the deity? Are you God in the flesh? Jesus said, verse 62, I am. And in those two words, he echoed the words of God at the burning bush. When Moses said, who will I say has sent me to free us from uh, Egypt? Gee, God said, I am. I am that I am. John echoes that, I am. That was Jesus at the burning bush. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. That was a proclamation of deity. I am the Son of God, the Son of Man, and I will return on clouds, even as Jesus said in Matthew 25. Well, they now are trying to entrap him to say that he is God. And to the Jew, for a man to say he is God is blaspheming. And so this is blasphemy, what they're looking for, unless, of course, that man is God, which is Jesus, of course. And so they tear their clothes and they say, he's convicted. We've convicted him. He's worthy of death because he has blasphemed and claimed to be God. So they are now beating him, verse 65, blindfolding him so he can't see the punches coming, striking him with the palms of their hands. And there's Peter, Peter who was following the Lord at a distance. If you're going to follow Jesus, don't follow him at a distance. I don't recommend not following the Lord at all. But if you're going to follow him, don't follow him at a distance. Either you're with him or you're against him. And so he's at a distance and he's blending in with the enemies and blending in with the crowd. And he's denying the Lord three times. And then verse 72, that rooster crows. You've denied me three times. Oh, how he wept. Oh, how he felt that he had turned on the one who loved him so much. Maybe you and I have identified that as well. We have turned on the Lord. We've denied him. We've sinned. We have done things which displease him. We had a chance to witness for him. We didn't do it. And oh, we weep. But there's forgiveness. This is Thursday night. It's now Friday morning, actually, early in the morning. And as, as I think there's a song about this, and others have said, it's Friday. And it's sad. But Sunday is coming. Chapter 15. He's now convicted by Rome because the Jews cannot put him to death. They are occupied by Rome. And Rome alone has the power to put someone to death. And now they're doing a third thing that's illegal. The first thing is they met on trial at night. The secondly, they were entrapping him to convict himself. Now they're changing the accusation against him on appeal. When you go on appeal in the courts, you don't change the indictment, the accusation. You've got to take the case up to the higher court. And in our civil law here, the court will look at the law. They look at the facts and say the lower court is the one that decides the facts, we look at the law to see if the facts were applied properly. 
But they deny that. They change it altogether. They drop the cause of blasphemy to catch Rome's favor. And they say now he claims to be a king. Caesar wouldn't care about blasphemy. Some man saying he's God. Caesar said he was God. They had gods and goddesses up and down the Appia Way in Rome. They couldn't care less. But for a man to say, I'm king, would make Rome nervous. If the man, Jesus, says, I'm king, Caesar might say that he's going to try to lead a rebellion. And we must come in and quell that rebellion, which incidentally happened 40 years later, when Titus in 70 AD came and led a rebellion I'm sorry, quelled a rebellion and scattered the Jews even to this day. So now the charge has changed. Uh, he goes before Pilate, the governor of Rome, uh, chapter 15. And here's the accusation that's now been changed. Verse 2, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, it is as you say. So he has, in the earlier trial with the Sanhedrin, claimed to be the son of God, the son of man. Now he claims to be king of Israel. And the chief priests uh, accused him of many things. Pilate didn't believe that he was guilty, decided to ship him over to Herod, who happened to be in town, King Herod. And that's the king Herod was over the area of Galilee where Jesus was from. He was trying to get rid of the case because he did not believe that Jesus was guilty. Pilate's wife said, don't convict this man. He's, guilty. He's not, not guilty. And so Pilate, so Herod now had a chance to uh, see him, and Herod uh, was interested in talking to him, but Jesus didn't talk to Herod at all. The cries are now coming up that uh, they want to see him crucified. The leaders are stirring up the crowd, verse 13, crucify him. Oh, what a cry of difference that was. This is Friday. What was the cry of the people on Sunday, the Sunday before? Yeah, Hosanna, save now, as they came into the city. Save now. Boy, what a change in our family. Love you, mother. Love you, dad. Love you, bro. Two weeks later, something happens and you don't talk. I was talking to one of the folks before service about a family, and uh, they haven't talked for many years. And I said, I've been there and done that with family members that don't communicate. I love you. Now I won't talk to you. Lord, it's in your hands. You do what you can. You can't always bring healing. Paul says, as much as lies within you, live at peace with all men. You do your part. But if they won't come, it takes two to tango. You just pray for them, that's all. So now the crowd has changed and turned against him. And it seems as though everything is going against Jesus. Everything is going Satan's way. Everything is going against Jerry being saved by the blood of Jesus. But behind it all is the Father with his sovereign plan. He has designed this from before the foundation of the world, that his Son would become the sinless, perfect sacrifice for all of us. John the Baptist got a hold of it when he talked to his disciples as Jesus walked by in the early part of Jesus' ministry. And John said, referring to Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. So all of this about the trial and about the beating and all of this was foreordained by God for us to be saved. Sometimes you and I have adversity which comes our way and it seems like everything's out of control and Satan is winning. But God is sovereign and he's working all things together for good if we'll trust in him. So the soldiers are mocking him, verse 16. And uh, they're beating him. They're, crucified. They're, they're taking him to the cross. They're causing him to be scourged. Look at verse 15. They took him to be scourged with the whip. And what is the purpose of the scourging? The scourging was not necessary for our deliverance from sin. His death was necessary for us to be delivered from sin. The scourging, was it just cruel and inhuman punishment? It had a purpose. Isaiah would say that the Messiah would be scourged and that by those wounds that he sustained, we'd be healed. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for us to have peace was upon him and by his stripes, his wounds, we are healed. So everything that God has is important. 
My mother used to say regarding our lives or in Jesus' life, God never wastes a thread. God never wastes a thread in the fabric of your life. The scourging was vital for Jesus to sustain because we needed physical healing. The death and the shedding of blood would take care of our spiritual healing, our cleansing from sin. But the scourging would take care of our physical healing. And as we take communion, and we take the bread, and we take the cup, we differentiate between the two. The bread was for our physical healing. The cup was for our spiritual healing. The bread for our healing of our wounds physically, mind, will, emotions. The blood represented by the cup for our sins being forgiven. So the next time you take communion, you thank God for the physical healing as you crunch down on that bread. You thank God for the spiritual healing as you drink that cup. Well, he now has gone through the scourging for our physical healing. He's now headed to the cross for our spiritual healing. And all these Old Testament prophecies about him are being fulfilled, not only about his beating, about his clothes being uh, divi uh, divided, his being crucified. That scourging was so bad at the whipping post that he was not even able to carry his cross. And by cross, we mean the cross piece. Uh, the artists like to give you a picture of him carrying the whole cross. No, the vertical piece was always left up at the place of crucifixion laying down on the ground. The cross piece was what the accused and convicted would carry. Arms strapped around the cross piece, around the neck, the accusation or the indictment, in his case, king of the Jews. And he tried to carry that cross piece. He was so weakened that he, a carpenter, a strong physical man of 33 years of age, was so debilitated in strength he could not carry it. The whipping was not only intense, don't believe when somebody says 39 stripes, that's not true. 39 stripes was for religious scourging. That was what God said, 40 was the maximum. So they made sure that when they scourged under Jewish law, they didn't make a mistake because if they went more than 40, the executioner would then receive the punishment himself. So they said, let's be safe, let's go 39. That's Jewish scourging. Roman scourging, as long as they wanted to. Every time they would strike that accused, hopefully that accused would cry out a, a sin, a crime, whether they did it or not, just to get it to stop. But if that, cry, that excuse did not open up his mouth, the next stroke was harder and harder and harder. Isaiah says in chapter 53, he opened not his mouth. Never said a word. But like a lamb before its shears is dumb, he was silent. So it got more and more intense. The whips, incidentally, they were made of leather uh, on the end of some kind of a piece of wood. And in that leather, to make things more interesting, they would put pieces of metal, pieces of stone. And as that whip went across their back, it would rip out not only flesh, but muscles and sinew. And the skeleton was so exposed. No wonder he couldn't carry that cross piece. But God always provides. Simon was there, verse 21, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, two believers, no doubt. And he was just coming by the country, didn't know what was going on. They said, hey, you, carry the cross piece. When Rome said, do it, you did it. They gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, to deaden the pain, but he said no. Nope, I'm going to take this full strength. My Savior did not get drunk. He was not anesthetized. He knew what he was doing. When I go through problems and trials, I don't have a half-drunk Savior who was drugged and didn't know what was going on. He knows exactly what I'm going through. And he was tempted as I, and yet without sin. So they crucified him, verse 24. They divided the garments, just as the Old Testament prophet said. It was the third hour, and they crucified him. That would be 9 o'clock in the morning. There is that accusation against him, the king of the Jews. He had two robbers, on, one on either side. Again, that was Old Testament prophecy. You can see the cross-references in your Bible. He was numbered with the transgressors. 
And those, those who passed by, they blasphemed, they made it worse, they mocked him, they made fun of him. Save yourself and come down from the cross, they said, verse 30. The chief priests would mock him. Verse 31, he saved others, himself he cannot save. They meant that mockingly. He saved others, himself he cannot save. But in that mocking, they spoke the truth. He saved others, but he could not save himself. He wanted to save himself. If it's possible, Father, let this cup pass from me. But he would not save himself. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. If he'd saved himself, he couldn't save me. But he thought more of me than he did of himself, and more of you. You talk about love, that servanthood, in the most important analysis. Let the Christ, the coming king of Israel, descend now. They mocked him. But then he, on the sixth hour, verse 33, that's now noontime, suddenly it became dark. The whole land was now dark until the ninth hour. I've always wondered why it was dark from noon until 3 p.m. And of course, 3 p.m. was the end of that suffering. Could it be that that was the darkest time, the darkest time of his suffering, a feeling as though the Father had turned from him because the Father would look at him and he would see sin and he would see prostitution and he would see lust and he would see anger, he would see murder, he would see all of the sins of all mankind. He also looked at Jesus and saw cancer and diabetes and all kinds of illnesses. And that's not how he created man. He didn't want to see that. He looked away from his son, and his son felt that absence of the father for the very first time in eternity. That's why he cries out in verse 34, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He felt for the first time in his life forsaken by God. You felt that at times, and so have I. Where are you, God? I don't feel you. I don't think you care. He felt that. Tell Jesus, I don't feel you're there, Lord. You've been there. Help me through this time. Well, they heard Eloi, and they, they misunderstood. They thought they said Eli. Eli would, of course, uh, be Elijah, Elias. And so they said, oh, this is going to be interesting. Let's see if Elias comes. But uh, they, they gave him so, another anesthesia, and he didn't want to drink it. And at that moment when he died at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, verse 38, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Why is that important? That veil separated the holy place from the most holy place. The holy place where the priest would minister with the table of showbread, the 12 loaves of bread, the bread of the presence of God. Lighting the candle lights for the light of the world. God is the light of the world. Jesus said he was the light of the world and now he's dead. And there's that altar of incense for the offering of the prayers. And then behind that, the veil behind that is the Ark of the Covenant. And nobody goes there except for the high priest. And he only goes on the Day of Atonement with the blood of a goat. And if those sins are not covered, then he dies. Nobody goes behind that veil. Jesus died now and that veil is ripped. Not bottom to top, top to bottom. What does that mean? Jesus in his death gave us access to God and the throne of God, not just on the Day of Atonement, but every day of the year, 24-7. His death, his ripping of his body, so to speak, symbolized by the ripping of the veil, showed access and acceptance by God of the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. If he had not been raised again, which he will be on Sunday, we'd have no knowledge of whether his sacrifice was acceptable to God. Right now he has died, and we already have a foretaste and a preview of God's acceptance. He dies on the cross. That alone doesn't tell us the acceptance. The ripping of the veil shows us that God is saying, I accept my son's sacrifice. To use the vernacular, pardon my French, y'all come. Come on in anytime you want. Well, the veil is torn in two. 
The centurion in verse 39 who saw him breathe his last had another affirmation of the innocence of Jesus as Pilate had said, his wife had said, truly this man was the son of God. Here's a Roman soldier who believed in multitudinous gods and goddesses, including Caesar. He's the son of God. How many affirmations we have in scripture. And with all due respect and love, the next time your doorbell is rung on a Saturday morning and two sweet people come in and want to talk with you about their knowledge and understanding of the Bible and the fact that Jesus is wonderful, but he's not God. He's not the son of God. He never claimed to be. You show this scripture along with so many others that Jesus is God, the Son of God. Pray for those Jehovah's Witnesses. Pray for those Mormons who come to your doors. Pray for Christian scientists, of which I was one for many years. Pray for those who are good people, but they don't know and acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. And you can get to heaven by acknowledging that and only by acknowledging that he is the Son of God. The women were watching. The men had fled. John was there. Mary, the mother of James, and Mary Magdalene, his own mother Mary, they were watching. They were watching because they wanted to make sure that they saw the ending of it. They weren't afraid, as the disciples were. They also wanted to see where he's going to be buried because they wanted to make sure that he was buried and anointed for burial properly. They were kind of like mothers, mothering to make sure it's all done right. When evening had come, verse 42, it was the preparation day, uh, the day before the Sabbath. So this is Friday, the Sabbath being Saturday. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member, that's a member of the Sanhedrin, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. He was wealthy. He had a tomb. It was new. He had never used it. He was on the Sanhedrin. He was not one of those who wanted to convict and, and murder Jesus. He wanted the body. He wanted it placed safely in his tomb. That's the best he could do. Pilate marveled that Jesus was already dead. He was only up there for six hours. People didn't die of crucifixion generally. They would die of asphyxiation. That's why they're going to break the legs of the other uh, crucified individuals because they could go on for days. If you can keep lifting yourself up, even though you have nails in your hands and your feet, keep lifting yourself up breathing, you can, you can go for days. But breaking your legs, you now have no strength to lift yourself up. Your lungs begin to fill with fluid and you choke to death. And so that's what's going to happen to them. But Jesus cannot be touched. His body cannot be touched or he is not the perfect sacrifice for God. Nobody can touch him. And so Pilate marvels that he's dead. Think about the fact that there were nail prints in his hands, nail prints in his uh, feet, and a sword just thrust indiscriminately into his side. If one of those instruments had chipped a bone in his body, chipped a bone, Jesus would not be the perfect, untouched sacrifice. He would not be acceptable to God. All those lambs and goats and bulls and turtle doves had to be as pure and clean and whole as possible all those 1,500 years. And one soldier just taking that sword and thrusting it through the side. Feel your own ribs. Boy, if you had a sword thrust in there or a spear, not likely you'd miss a bone. Take your own hands. Try to put a, a nice big spike through. Can you? And yet God guided even those to make sure that not one bone was chipped. Details like that God cares about. The number of hairs on my head, which every day is getting fewer and fewer, he knows every detail of my life. He knows the details of your lives. He cares about us. Well, go ahead, take the body. And we know that they then took the body down, not only Joseph, but another council member, our friend Nicodemus, who we saw in John chapter 3, the one that asked about eternal life. Praise God, he accepted the Lord. And he was there with Joseph. And they took that body. Verse 46, bought fine linen, took him down, wrapped him in the linen, laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock, rolled a stone, that's a big, large stone, against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joses, observed where he was laid. 
And so here are these precious women watching and waiting. They're not afraid. They're not afraid. They think they're going to have to go in and complete the anointing. They think that perhaps Joseph and Nicodemus didn't do a complete job. So they're going to wait until Sunday morning. They can't go tomorrow, which is Saturday, because the Sabbath day says no work. And they're going to have to somehow find that big stone and pull it back. How they're going to do it, they don't know. And there's going to be a guard, a Roman guard. And what are you going to do with those guys? And how do you get them out of the way? They don't know. But they're going to do what they can. Even as Joseph did what he could, and Nicodemus, and all of us should do what we can. And so the scene is now set for Sunday morning. As they're going to be going to the tomb early. We'll cover this story on Sunday. I hope you can join us. We'll continue with chapter 16. We're going to see the rest of the story and the greatest news the world has ever known. He is risen. Amen. So chapter 14, we saw that he was delivered up because of our offenses. And now we're anticipating uh, Sunday's message. He was raised because of our justification. I know that I am forgiven because of the resurrection. The price paid by Jesus was sufficient. Job accomplished. So the greatest story ever told. Love so divine. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this chance to have gone through the final hours of the Lord Jesus Christ. May this story always be fresh and new and revive in us such a sense of our own sinfulness and of our own sense of being forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ and also of our healing of our physical problems because of the stripes of the scourging. Lord, let us reach out to you in love and gratitude to offer to share this good news with others because on Sunday we're going to talk about the fact that this Mary Magdalene and the other Mary and others are going to go and see that he's risen, the tomb is empty, and they're going to go out and tell others, including the disciples the good news. And so, Come and See and Go Tell has been the format throughout all of these decades for the last 2,000 years. Come and see that he has risen and go tell others that he wants them saved. And help us to do the same thing tonight, Lord. Come and see that the tomb is empty and go tell others that he wants to be raised in their hearts for their salvation. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Oh